everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm Debbie Nicole. I'm the chairperson of the workshop committee for Kent County Master Gardeners. And we have several presenters here today that are ready to answer your questions. Um, I just want to let you know that we will do the best we can to answer everything based on our own experience and knowledge. Um, if there's anything that we find we are unable to help you with, we will be happy to make a note of it and get back to you later. Um, the first thing we're going to do is go through the pre-submitted questions uh, and pictures that you guys sent in. And then uh, after that, we will open it up to just the question and answer period for those of you who did not um, send in questions in advance. Um, our presenters today, uh, Karen Abadi is joining us on the phone, I believe. Um, Carla Bolter is here. Uh, Hi. And uh, Kathy Doyle is also here to help and Linda Sperry. Um, and then Megan and I are here to also help if needed. Um, so with that, we will go on and begin and start with the first question that was submitted. Um, and I believe Linda, you were gonna tackle this one um, about this uh, cucurbit plant. So Linda, um, this person sent in pictures of this volunteer Perkabit in her garden, and um, you were having some questions for identifying it. Uh, yes, uh, apparently uh, what you have there is a type of squash volunteer that has come up and you can usually uh, tell the difference between a squash uh, plant leaf and a cucumber leaf by the shape. Uh, cucumbers are normally triangular in shape, uh, whereas your squash will, will be more rounded and tend to have three to five lobes to the leaf. And that's basically the, how you can tell the difference. And otherwise you can wait till a squash develops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I did last year. Okay, this that question came from Vera and I think she's here today, so. Um, I hope that that uh, helped with that. Um, next question came from Barry Weissman, who I believe just arrived also. Um, I think Carla, you were gonna talk about this. Good morning. Um, Mary, I had tried to um, answer this question when you had asked an ex ask extinction. And unfortunately, I seem to have not been able to get the answer to go through. So what you have is a smoke tree or smoke bush. Um, if you would like for it to be a shorter, bushier form, you can cut it back um, probably in late winter, early spring, uh, February, March, that kind of time. And it should form a more compact bush. Uh, it's known for its flowers uh, that kind of look like smoke when you look at them from a distance. Uh, they also are known for very good fall color. It's a very nice tree. And uh, I think that uh, Probably to make it look better, because I, I did look at the pictures that you sent, um, you should probably cut it back if, in the uh, this coming year. And it'll form a, a very pretty little bush. And uh, I think that was about it. Thank you. Carla, do you know if this is a native? I believe it is. Awesome. Um, actually, Wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> no, I correct myself. Um, I do believe that the form that you're looking at is a European uh, shrub tree. Oh, but there's a native version? There may be. There may be. But I don't think the one that's normally sold, I don't think that one is native. Okay, um, 
Our next question comes from Lucrecia. Um, and I believe Karen, you were gonna tackle this one. Yes, can you all hear me? Yes. So um, Lucretia, I do not have African violets, but um, I did do some research on aphids on house plants. Um, as you can see on the slide here, um, there are several recommendations, including physical removal that would involve a cotton swab dipped in alcohol uh, and gently uh, rubbing the affected areas. Um, you can also use a forceful spray of water. Oftentimes this will knock the aphids off. Um, there are pesticides that can be used, um, insecticidal soaps, um, neem oil, plant oil extracts. Um, just be mindful of those because some of these um, pesticides can be toxic to bees. So this is a house plant, so I don't know that that's necessarily as much of a concern, uh, but if you are putting it outside um, in this heat to get a little sun, uh, you might wanna be mindful of that. Um, I also wanted to just briefly talk about prevention. Um, keep in mind that um, you need to choose healthy plants from the onset and they have to match the indoor environment that you're putting them in um, to minimize pest issues. Proper watering and proper plant care is really valuable. Um, oftentimes you'll see images of people watering plants from above. Um, we really only wanna be watering the soil. Um, when the leaves and the flowers and such get wet, the stems that could lead to or, or um, allow for um, conditions to occur, whether it be aphids or, you know, um, a whole bunch of things depending on uh, the plants. Um, make sure that your plant is potted in a space where it has good drainage. Um, I see an awful, awful lot of um, pots that don't have drainage holes underneath. So um, again, I don't know your conditions, but I was just kind of taking a ballpark guess at all of this. Um, and lastly, um, you know, it's always a little challenging for all of us with these images, but um, it's not unusual for African violets to develop aphids. Um, you might also want to look at the option of mealybugs or mites. Um, that is not uncommon with African violets as well. Um, so I hope you find that helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Um, the next question goes to Carla. Okay, um, I noticed that this bed is very close to the lawn and I'm not sure whether you lime your soil uh, for your lawn. Um, azaleas really do like a more acidic soil. Um, lime and them don't get along. Uh, the fact that uh, it's losing uh, some of its leaves, or a lot of its leaves actually, um, the first thing I would do is have a soil test done on that bed to make sure. Azaleas really like somewhere's in the ballpark of 5.6 for a pH. Um, I would also check to make sure that the moisture level is fairly consistent. Uh, they don't really want to dry out and sometimes when they get stressed like that, they'll drop their leaves. The other thing you could check for, and I didn't add this into my answer, um, is to see if they have azalea lace bugs. And the way you'll see that is when you look at the leaves, they're stippled white. And if you flip the leaf on over, you know, and look at the underside, you'll see little black dots. Uh, that usually is a pretty good indication that you have azalea, azalea lace bugs. And they're pretty much symp symptomatic when you've got the plant in the wrong place. So if the plant's getting stressed because it's too dry, um, the sun level can be, you know, you can get away with more sun as long as the plant stays moist. But if you have sun and drought, that's a bad combination for them and they will uh, be attacked by these lace bugs. Um, there are sprays that you can use, but I've found myself 
that just moving an azalea to a maybe a shadier, more moist spot where the um, soil is acidic will cure the problem. They have gone, I've had some that had azalea lace bugs and when I've moved them to a better location, the uh, lace bugs are no longer present. Um, you can try cutting them back also. They're, you know, cut them back, keep them watered decently and uh, you'll find that they should rebound. They're pretty tough plants actually. Um, try these things and see if that'll work. Thank you, Carla. Um, going on to the next question. We had a couple of tomato questions here in a row, and I believe yeah, Marie right here, um, is going to try to talk about this. Right. Karen, are you available? Hi, I'm sorry. I was trying to unmute. I apologize. Um, so Vera, you had sent in this question with um, the, the leaves that look like they had been eaten. And you'll see on the screen that I had originally thought it was a leaf miner. Um, that's a potential option. But the more I thought about this, the more I kind of came up with some other potential ideas. Um, there is a tomato spotted wilt virus um, that involves tiny insects called therps. Um, anytime you're seeing holes like this, um, it leans more towards a pest than a, um, you know, a fungus or any kind of things like that. Um, the therps can be acquired um, through a virus. And essentially what they do is they feed on weeds and ornamental hosts, and then they come to the tomato plants. Um, the other two ideas that came to mind, um, and again, you don't see any like pests on your photo per se, um, but you'd have to look. Slugs are a common cause of holes in leaves. The thing with slugs is that they'll often be unseen because they feed at night. Um, the larger slugs will eat the um, outer edge of the leaves and the smaller slugs will cause irregular holes in the centers of the leaves. Um, so that's a potential option. Earwigs are also a potential option. Um, they have a really ragged, irregular chopping pattern though. Um, so I don't know that that would necessarily be, but you, you've got a couple of options there. It could be um, the slugs, it could be the spotted wilted virus, or it could be um, potentially earwigs. Um, and again, I apologize not to have more information, but again, it's a little challenging when you know, the, the pictures are great, but sometimes it's a little struggle. I know, I love the, I love the pink background because that gave a nice contrast so you could really see it better. So good job with the pictures there. Um, Absolutely. It is really, really difficult to diagnose uh, problems. Uh, for sure. It's a lot easier to to diagnose a, a disease. Um, so, but we do the best we can with our virtual environment here. Um, so we're going to go ahead to the next question, which was also about uh, tomatoes. And I believe that this is the one, Karen, that you had said looked like the looked like the spotted wilt virus. Um, do you have any more to say about that? She's muted again. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was talking to you and you weren't hearing me. Yes, this image, as I said, the more I thought about it, the more this looks far more like that to my tomato spotted wilted virus. And again, that's caused by the therps. Uh, and it is a virus that is carried by them to the tomato plants. Often you will see that several weeks after transplanting the tomato plants. Um, and you might even see it occurring on the younger leaves. Um, if it's a super young plant that this is occurring on, um, oftentimes they might cause them to wilt and die up. Older tomato plants might actually um, survive a little bit better. Um, the first step to controlling that would be eliminating the weeds 
uh, if you have them in the garden, you know, keeping the grass and weeds mowed in the area as well to limit, um, you know, those vectors from carrying that virus over. Um, sometimes you will see people put like aluminum or a silver color reflected material um, because that actually has been found to reduce uh, the number of therps surviving on the plant, as crazy as it sounds. Um, but there is no cure. Um, for this condition. Okay. Then, um, our next question um, was about these little fuzzy things on this lavender plant. Um, either, either Megan or Carla, you both have the same answer to this one. So whoever wants to take this. Megan, go ahead. I'll let you this one. I was going to say, I was going to say you got this, Carla. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I first saw this a few years ago on some evergreens, and um, I was actually pretty fascinated. Um, so it's called the, the spittle bug, and um, they're really easy to remove. You can remove them with a, a damp cloth or spray them off with a hose. They, they typically don't cause a whole lot of damage on your woody plants, and, you know, I would not recommend using any pesticides or, or things to get rid of them. You can really just you know, spray them off there, but it's really, you know, it's a spittle bug, and it looks like the bug has, has spit uh, from the opposite end there, and, you know, it's it's a, uh, encasing their... Uh, you know, their cell to keep them moist. So, um, Carla, do you have anything to add about the spittle bug? I agree. They're relatively harmless. I don't think you're going to find a lot of damage, but if you don't like the looks of them, go ahead and spray them off and remove them. Um, lavender's a pretty tough plant. Um, other than that, yeah, no, I, I think that they're more unsightly than, you know, a problem. Now, do these get on other plants besides lavender, or is it just a common common thing for lavender? No, actually, they get on pretty much anything. I've seen them on a, a wide variety of different plants, but I've never found them to be problematic. Actually, they've never gotten on my lavender, so. <laughs> I had them, and I, I don't even remember what they were on. I know I've seen them before, but I can't remember. Okay. Um, our next question is about insect problems. Um, and I can take this one if you guys want me to because um, I kind of have a bug thing. Um, so uh, this person, um, not sure if she's here, um, but she uh, sent in the she has aphids, slugs, all kinds of um, And she has uh, tried different things to do this, but um, I would have, first of all, I would, I always recommend that you use uh, to control any insects, what we call integrated pest management or IPM. Uh, so you're starting with the, the simplest and then working your way, way up to the most, really the least harmful up to the most harmful. So the first thing you wanna do, and it's kind of what you said you were doing was actually physically removing the bugs and squishing them, which is, is kind of what I do. So you can do that. Um, another way to physically um, stop bugs from getting on your plants is to use a floating row cover. Um, you can buy these and they're like a big uh, sheet of, of, I mean, if you sew, it's like, it's like unwoven um, interfacing kind of, is a white um, semi-transparent um, sheet of, of a fabric feeling stuff. But you can cover your plants while they're growing to keep the bugs off. The only thing you have to remember to do is once those plants start blooming, you want the pollinators to be able to get to the plants. So you can take, you need to take the, uh, the row covers off. Um, with aphids, aphids are really, really not that harmful. Uh, you can spray them off with a hose and uh, they might come back. But if you just spray them again, they don't really, really cause a lot of damage on outdoor plants. And the really cool thing about aphids is they will attract ladybugs to your garden and because ladybugs love to eat aphids. They will make very short work of those aphids. Um, if you plant a lot of, of maybe flowering herbs or other flowers, you'll attract all kinds of beneficial bugs to your garden 
and those things will take care of the bad bugs. So that's a, that's called biological control, which is kind of what I use. And I really don't have a bug problem in my garden because I also plant um, flowering herbs such as my garlic chives are all awesome for attracting beneficial insects. Um, I have marigolds, nasturtiums, um, and then the other flowering herbs I have are like uh, the basil and oregano. If I let some of those flower, that helps. Um, lavender helps too. Uh, actually, the smell of lavender will repel some of the bad insects. So um, that's another uh, way of cultural control. Another good way of cultural control is to practice crop rotation. So for example, I had a problem with squash bugs one year. Well, my zucchini got eaten and killed. So the next year, I can't couldn't plant zucchini in that same location because the squash bugs will overwinter in the soil and they'll just come back and eat the next food like you're serving it to them. Um, so that's another way of cultural control is crop rotation, which is, is, is also very important for your soil, not only for insects. Um, and like I said, biological control is attracting the good bugs. Um, attract those, uh, those lady beetles, those dragonflies, um, and praying mantis, and assassin bugs, you have to be careful because they'll eat everything. If they catch a bee, they'll eat the bee. Um, so um, you have to make sure you don't have too many of them. Um, but that's a, that's a form of biological control. Remember that if you put out pesticides for these things, you're not only, most pesticides are general and they will kill everything. So you're killing not only your problem bugs, but you also could potentially be killing those bees, the pollinators, and the, the, the bugs that would have eaten those bad bugs. That's why we say chemical control as a last resort. Um, if you do want to use um, some kind of a pesticide, the only ones that I use at my house um, that actually spray are um, insecticidal soap, um, which is not very harmful, and neem oil. It's just any of these things, you still want to make sure if you're going to spray something on your plants, you don't do it at a time of day when the pollinators are active. So you wait till, you know, evening or sometime when they've all gone home before you before you spray with anything to avoid uh, any potential harm to any other insects. Um, and I think she also mentioned slugs. Um, I have been pretty successful with either just picking them off or putting uh, the take a tuna can with some cheap beer in it because we found that, you know, you don't want to waste your good beer because they don't like it anyway. They love a little bit of Budweiser, you know. So you put your tuna can at ground level. So dig a little a little hole and put your tuna can in there and fill it up with your cheap beer. I did that and went out the next morning and I had three slugs in there. So it actually works really, really well. Um, they do have other kinds of slug breaks. And slug traps, but this has worked for me. So that's that's what I just wanted to Absolutely. So I hope, that, I hope that answers your question about pests. If you have any other questions, be sure to uh, email us because that's a that's a big question. There's a lot of pests out there. Um, I'd like to just jump in on the uh, the beer traps for uh, slugs. They're amazingly effective. Apparently, slugs are alcoholics, and they really do uh, attract a lot of slugs. Uh, I have hostas in pots and uh, I usually set out mm, three, four, five beer cans with, or, you know, can, tuna cans with beer in them. And they're amazingly effective. Yeah. One thing actually about slugs, um, there are some, there are a lot of varieties of slugs and there's a, a, the leopard slug in particular, the one that's really big and spotted actually is a, is a really good garden cleaner. It doesn't eat live plants, it cleans up dead plants and debris and cl actually cleans up your garden. So the the, uh, the uh, brown slugs, I believe, are the ones that are, are harmful. No, it's the gray slugs. Brown snails, gray slugs. Um, those are the ones that will eat your plants. So if they're the little tiny ones, those are actually the more harmful ones. The big fat spotted ones, um, I, I leave them alone because they, they eat garbage instead of um, plants. Um, that's exactly right. That's that's exactly right. If they are, um... We're going to go on to uh, the next question, which um, was about a uh, person who sent this in has had multiple problems with her plants in her garden, and she had some 
uh, bush beans and pole beans. And I am not a bean expert, so I'm not really sure if this is a bush bean or a um, pole bean. I don't know if anybody else here knows that much about beans. Uh, to um, me, that looks like a it looks like a bush bean. Yeah, that's what I would say too. Bush I've bean. Seen it in multiple pictures, and um, I just had to pick one <laughs> that was representative. Um, but if you guys know, I, I actually talk to uh, some of our other master gardeners who sometimes help with these things. Uh, Larry and Leslie Cook, who recently did a presentation on beans, and his answer was that it could be um, any of these things, fungal infections, bacterial infections, or nutrient imbalance, um, and that he recommended a soil test, which we always recommend anyway. Um, and I believe that there's another question about squash where you're also getting this pale color um, to, your, to your plants. So we would need, in order to help you further, we would really need to know um, if there's something missing from your soil, if you're missing some nutrients. Um, anybody else want to say anything about this question? Linda? Any other ideas? No, uh, uh, the only other thing I could think of would be uh... No, it have to be nutrients. Um, either that or it's not getting enough sun. I, I don't know where it's planted. Yeah, um, we would probably need to um, get, get more question and answer from um, this person who has this. So if you're on here today at the end, um, if you would like to uh, talk to us a little bit more and maybe we could get a little bit more information so we could help you better. Um, that being said, um, this is, came from the same person. So they're apparently having the same kinds of problems with multiple things in the garden. Uh, her curcubits, her um, melons, uh, cucumbers, and squash you know, are all in the same family. And they have similar problems, are also having these issues. So, Linda, you in your room? Since you're the squash lady. <laughs> Linda, are you there? I'm here. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, my guess would be nitrogen. It, it's, it's needing nitrogen. Um, definitely soil deficiency of some sort. And again, mm -hmm. soil test will answer that problem for you. The soil test actually will not um, detect nitrogen. Correct. But if you think your if your plants aren't green enough and aren't bushy enough, then that's a good sign that they do need nitrogen. Um, you can put something like uh, if you want to go organic. I believe this person said she was trying to do organic. Um, I think blood meal is a good source of nitrogen. Mm -hmm. um, so I would try uh, getting some of that. I believe you can just get that pretty much anywhere at any any uh, big box or or garden store. So that would probably be a recommendation that I would try. One other thing um, I'd like to add to, I'm not sure when she planted these, but you know, it could also be some sun scald. You know, we've had some really hot days the last few days. And if you planted a, a tender little baby, you know, it, it could have, <laughs> it could have some sun scald on there as well. So I'm not sure, point. I'm not sure when this picture was taken, whether it was like yesterday or, or what, but with some of this heat, it will impact some really tender, tender, tender newbies. Yeah, we don't even know how much sun it's, how much sun it's getting. So my cucumbers haven't even sprouted yet. I don't know what's going on with them. <laughs> okay, um, the next question was from someone who was having trouble starting seeds. And um, I think uh, either uh, Karen, Linda, Megan, you were both chiming in on this. Um, she had seeds in her, in, that she tried to start in her basement, but we really don't know if she had uh, what kind of light or heat she had on those. Um, and also uh, she tried to start them again later in a greenhouse. So we don't really know the details of what was going on, um, but we can speak to this a little bit. Um, Linda or, or Karen or Megan, you wanna chime in and talk about starting seeds? Well, one of the things uh, for you, you've got a lot of different plants named here and, and depending on what the plant is, the seeds have different requirements to be started. Um, some of them require their, their feet to be warm while they're to get them to germinate, others don't. Um, you could have your temperature too high, too low. 
Uh, you may not have enough, a strong enough uh, grow light with them. And then again, you, you said you started them in the winter. How far back in the winter you may be trying to start them much too soon for the season. Um, normally these, these types of plants here are, are warm weather plants. Um, if you're starting them in, in the winter, uh, you're not gonna have the outside conditions ready for the plants when they should be transplanted. Yeah, I believe most of the was trying to start the mostly flowers, sunflowers, asters, um, rubecchia, um, and they didn't start. And um, I don't know what everybody else does, but for sunflowers, when I grow them, I just direct sow them in my garden. I just plant, plant the sunflower seeds in my garden. Um, but uh, I'm not really big on starting seeds indoors because I just don't have the space. Um, so, you know, we would need to probably get you to mostly read your seed packets and follow those directions carefully. And you have to do different things with different seeds, like Linda said. Um, Megan, did you want to say anything more about this? No, I mean, just, you know, that some, some require scarification, some require a, a lot of different things. And, and, you know, depending on, you know, she's trying to start some ornamentals and some natives and things like that. She could even be cooking them. You know, if you have them too hot, you can cook the seeds. So um, that was just kind of my two cents. You really have to, to know it's not a one problem fixes everything. Each seed requires a little bit more. Uh, Judy Fister from Sussex County, she starts a lot. When I say a lot, I mean a lot of native seeds. Mm -hmm herself and you know she's got different processes that she uses some sandpaper she you know she has methods to her madness and she has really great germination but she's been at it for a while but you really have to read the back of the seed packets and see just what is required to have a uh, great success one thing i wanted to mention and i'm assuming that she is using fresh seed but the age of the seed and how it is stored also affects your, your germination rates Okay, and if uh, this, this question came from uh, Lucrecia, so if she's here today, maybe we can um, talk more about this at the end. Okay, our next question, I think, uh, Linda, you were going to really talk about uh, the privet problem. Yeah, a privet um, actually is called Chinese privet. And it was introduced uh, to this country in, uh, in the mid 1800s as an ornamental and it, it's escaped like so many of the invasives now in our country. Um, and it, it can be very difficult to control. There's three basic ways um, to address this. You could do foliar, you could do cut stump, um, and then you can, there's some, some other procedures you can do like basal bark applications and such. Um, it depends on where, where your hedge is or where your privet's located, what's around it as to what option you're going to go for. If you have other, if you have ornamentals around it, grass around it, things that you're trying to preserve, then foliar sprays probably are not going to be what you want to go with. And you also have to be mindful of something called drift, uh, where this may be where you're spraying it on the privet, but actually it's blowing someplace else entirely and will wipe out that plant as well. My favorite for this, and actually for honeysuckle as well, uh, is, is cut stump. Um, you can be much more direct about what you're doing and what you basically do uh, with loppers or with a chainsaw is you cut this thing to the ground, right down, stump right to the ground. And then you're gonna paint the, the cut part that you just cut and, and usually within three minutes, you don't wanna go any longer than that. You're gonna paint that with um, something like a glyphosate product. There's a, a, a number of different products that we can get you that information. And you're also going to want to get around the, the outer edge um, of the bark as well. And what this does is it's kind of systemic. It goes down into the, to the um, plant, down to the roots, and it will kill it that way. Um, but one word of caution, you're looking at something that could take two to three years to eradicate. 
this it doesn't happen overnight. It's it's a long process. Okay. Um, thank you, Linda. Fortunately, I'm so glad I don't have any of this here. You yeah, have me too. <laughs> Okay, um, our next question uh, came from um, Karen Colias too, I believe. Um, and I think, uh, Carla, you had some information about this. I was trying to figure this one out yesterday and I was basically um, just grasping at straws because I really couldn't find any definite information about how this could happen, where you could have one type of willow tree that would be growing branches that appeared to be from a different type of willow tree. So um, the, the only thing I could think of is that it's actually a cross between the two types, which does exist. Um, and, uh, but uh, Carla had some other, other ideas. So Carla, why don't you take this one? Well, the one thing that uh, popped into my mind is, and I, I'm not too sure, but it could have been grafted, uh, in which case uh, a lot of times uh, the plant that the, was used for the rootstock will try to, you know, dominate. So that may be why. But if it's not a grafted plant, uh, my other thought was that it's sporting uh, sometimes. And, you know, I'm not that familiar with the, the corkscrew willows, but I know, say, for instance, with hostas, um, you'll have a variegated hosta and all of a sudden you'll see green leaves mm -hmm. and you have to get rid of the green leaves. You've got to get rid of the part that's not the same as what you want. Uh, so my thought is that if you keep cutting off anything that looks odd, any you know part that's definitely not your corkscrew willow, that you know that may take care of the problem. And, and also, we don't have any information as to the age of this of this tree and whether or not this is you know that it was coming up as a cor regular corkscrew willow for years and then all of a sudden um it started developing different branches so that makes a difference that would that would probably not be a sign that it was grafted <laughs> um but it's uh we don't have that information i know that the corkscrew is not a native type of willow and it um it is a short-lived tree um but they're I, from what i understand they're pretty good screen um, trees. So uh, that's that's our, our thoughts on that issue. Debbie, who who submitted this question? Uh, I believe Karen Kalias did. That's what I thought. Um, Karen, if you're here, um, let me dig into this uh, question a little deeper and I will get back with you on that if I can find something else on Thanks. it. And I am here and and it's a 20 year old tree and the weeping willow branches just came out like about three years ago. Hmm. So yeah, I'll follow up with you. Now the, the branches are definitely coming off of the uh, corkscrew willow, not like down yeah. at the base. No, off, uh, off the um, actual tree, yeah. Okay. It's really freaky. Huh. <laughs> Okay, well, let me dig into this question a little more and uh, I can get back with you on that. Thank you. Yeah, Karen, I couldn't find any record of this ever happening before <laughs> anywhere. So you have like I that. Know. Like a and when I take pictures of it, it's really hard. Unless you're right there, then you're like, oh my God. But it's hard to show it in the picture for some reason. So, but yeah. thank you. <laughs> I know this is not your picture. This is just a picture I found. That was no, that was great because I didn't send them pictures and I turned my stuff in late. So I, I appreciate it. This is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I hope it looks something like your corkscrew. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, um, our next question, um, I believe we're going to go back to Linda. I think she touched on this earlier um, about uh, controlling this invasive honeysuckle, which is something that I have. <laughs> Yeah, um, pretty much like the privet. This is this is a major problem in this country, um, and and you're basically looking at mechanical removal, which is when it's identifiable. Which, incidentally, the the easiest way to find this is to wait to the fall, 
uh, when all the other leaves have turned and fallen uh, or even into the winter because the honeysuckle will stay green and you can identify it very easily. Um, but you can do the mechanical removal until you get down to the to the root um, where you can or the stump you can there again come in with your stump cut and and do the treatment there you can do prescribed burning and there are chemicals that you can spray on it as well but there again you have to be careful of what's around it if you're going to be spraying um, and of course drift um, and then i think uh, Karen had some other information in here. Karen, are you there? Well, one of the ones I, I can see from her note here was um, to, to basically cut it back again, get a large garbage bag, black garbage bag, tie it around the stem as tight as you can tie it. And what you're going to be doing is starving it of light uh, and nutrients. And then after about six months, four to six months, it should be dead. And then you can also remove the stump at that time. Um, it's, it's difficult if you have a mature stump, a rather large one, if you can uh, find your stump and look for the um, branches that go off to it underground and start cutting from that area towards the stump, it'll be a little bit easier to get control of it. But trying to get the main stump out without doing something like the stump cut or killing the stump off uh, is gonna be rather difficult because it has a really deep root. Let me jump uh, in on that also, if you don't mind, because um, I have a lot of honeysuckle behind my house and uh, what I have done is, you know, mechanically you pull it. You just keep pulling it. Uh, keep an eye on it after you've pulled it all out because there's always roots that will try and re-sprout. And every time you see it, just pull it. Because once the plant has no leaves, it's not going to continue to grow for long. If you have a large area with, you know, where it's all just honeysuckle, I have had luck with brush killer. Um, I found that effective. And then after it's died off, I just pull that out. And there again, you know, just watch for any little sprouts, which usually aren't very many by the time I've gotten done with all of that. It, it's pretty effective. Just, you know, pull out the sprouts if you see them. And uh, I have reclaimed quite a bit of uh, land in back of my yard by doing that, persistence is the key. Yeah, my husband goes out and yanks it all the time. It's easy to find right now because it's blooming. Um, it smells good, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, the problem, the main problem we have, and we have to keep is keep it from strangling the trees that I plant. You know, I plant these little uh, nice little trees to try to. Um, Kind of reforest my back area and then the honey, honeysuckle starts winding its way around the around the trees pretty quickly and I have to keep pulling it and pulling it so um, I don't think that the honeysuckle starts on our property so that's the other thing is when it's on somebody right. else's property you mm -hmm. can't really uh, go over there and light it on fire <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, yeah it's a it's an ongoing battle for sure Okay, um, the next question is our last pre-submitted question. Um, well, this is actually one that was kind of generated by ourselves because we thought this might be something a little bit that people would be interested in. Um, if you want to put in like a little border garden, um, what kind of plants would you use that are easy to grow? Um, and I think Megan and Carla and Linda all had some input on this one. so. Um, Whoever wants to talk about this and some of the plants on this list can jump in. Linda, you want to start? Okay. Uh, well, I'd lead off with phlox, asters, um, geraniums, and as Carla pointed out, uh, the hardy geraniums are preferable. Um, sage, don't forget your herbs because they are fabulous for pollinators. So you could plant sage, rosemary, oregano, 
Um, keep in mind though that oregano has a tendency to kind of walk, so you have to keep it under control. You could also go with marigolds, uh, uh, chrysanthemums, just to name a few. Yeah, I agree. All of them. Uh, Black-eyed Susans are easy to grow. Unfortunately, Black-eyed Susans will kind of get out of hand if you don't deadhead them. That is to say, when the flower has died, you know, cut it off. Because if you let it go to seed, it will, it will kind of take over your garden. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of things that I've got out front. Um, I've had good luck with uh, Coreopsis. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the fine leafed version, um, like Moonbeam, uh, it's been spreading beautifully. I have a, a very sunny front yard. Um, asters, New England asters, uh, great for fall color. Um, I've had good luck with uh, like fireworks goldenrod. I've have not noticed fireworks spreading the way some of the common goldenrods will. You wouldn't want them in there because they'll take over your garden very quickly, but the fireworks does behave itself nicely. Hmm. Don't forget annuals. Um, I'm not a, an annual snob. I think there's a lot to be said for you know, when you start a new garden and you've put in your perennials, it's going to take them a couple years to fill in. So, you know, you fill in the gaps with annuals and, you know, you can't beat the fact they bloom all season long. Yeah, annuals are good too, because if you end up, you, you didn't really like them, then you just don't plant them again. <laughs> right. <laughs> I would just add if you, if you've got, um, you know some some space to consider butterfly weed uh milkweed not butterfly bush oh, yeah. but butterfly weed because the monarch butterflies that's that's the only the only plant that they will um that can host the larva but it takes a little while to establish it but um it's beautiful when it gets established yeah, and there again yeah. i would be you know be careful of what type of uh, milkweed you do plant. Um, the common milkweed will spread everywhere mm -hmm. and you'll just be yanking it out. But uh, I believe the uh, yellow and orange flowered varieties, uh, I haven't grown them myself. Uh, does anybody else have any experience with them, whether they're a little more behaved? I yeah, found the orange, um, the and it's Asclepius tuberosa is mm -hmm. the, uh, I believe the right name for the one that doesn't go crazy, I think. I'm a newbie here, guys. That's why you haven't heard from me, but. Hey. Learning, I am learning so much. Everybody's a newbie <laughs> you That's know. That's right. Um, I have the orange, I have the orange one. And I also, I think I planted some swamp milkweed How's that for, for keeping under control? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I've done Joe pie weed, which is pretty crazy and big and fluffy and beautiful. I planted it against a sunny fence. It seemed to stay put. Yeah, I don't have any of that. Okay. Um, well, that is the last question we had here, but I did get another one, a late submission from Laurel, and I believe she's here, Laurel Ferris. Um, she wanted to know, and I think Carla, you had answered this too, um, she has invasive thistles popping up in her vegetable garden. Um, they've been digging them up, but she says the thistles are winning, um, and they're doing, they're trying to use, you know, organic controls. Um, they don't really want to use chemicals. So uh, Carla, you were going to, I think you had some answers to this one. Yeah. Um, when you dig the roots, make sure you get down far enough. I'm not sure if they may have a tap root and you want to get rid of that. Um, yeah, wait till you've had a nice good rain. So the soil's right. you know pretty soft and then you have better luck getting most of the root out. 
<laughs> right. But there again, persistence, you know, every time you see any trace of it, pull it. It will not survive without leaves. And also, you know, use a nice good mulch uh, over top. Uh, you want to cut down the light. You don't want them to germinate. So the mulch will help take care of that as well. Yep. And when you see it coming up, cut it. I mean, if you, you know, if you can't get all that root pulled up, if you, if you just kind of, you have to kind of keep at it or it's just right. going to keep coming. So you got to try to starve it and, you know, use that solarization method, method, either with, you know, something, you know, dark plastic or, you know, use some nice mulch, you know, just to kind of, you got to snub it out really. Right. It, it, you know, if you don't want to use chemicals, I think you mentioned that you didn't want to use chemicals to control it. Okay. I don't think I have any of that, but we had it in Colorado big time. <laughs> your neighbors would get really mad at you in Colorado if you didn't get your thistles out of there. They didn't care about anything else but that. Yeah, the same, the same thing, you know, uh, I, my family has a, a horse farm and, you know, I just remember being young, riding in the gator with pup up, digging the thistles out of the field. I mean, at, you know, all the time, it was a constant thing that we did. And, you know, 30 years later, we still get them. So just saying, <laughs> even with, with, uh, you know, mechanical management, you, you know, still, it still can be a problem. Right. And seeds can stay the in the seed bank that is in the soil. They can stay there for years and years. So, you know, that's why you end up 30 years later still trying to get rid of stuff sometimes. Uh, do you want to go ahead with the questions in the chat box, Debbie, or did you have any more up your sleeve? Debbie, um, there's, did you have a question about an overgrown rhododendron? I don't think so. I didn't get one about that. But is there one? Okay. Is there one I'm in the chat? I'm getting box? my uh, asks confused. Oh, um, yeah, that might have been on ask extension, Carla. It could have been, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, if, if I missed anybody's question, I apologize. A lot of them came in at once and I was juggling. So um, uh, I tried to put them in in the order that they came in by the, the date, the time and date they were submitted. Um, but it's possible that somewhere in a, in a long chain, I could have missed something. So if I missed your question, um, we do have time here that we're going to take some here. I'm going to actually um, finish out this PowerPoint and stop my share so we can see everybody. So uh, there's our, our disclaimer that if we mention any products by name, we're not endorsing them. We're just using them as an example for something that's, uh, that could be used. Um, and we are also uh, an equal opportunity provider. Um, and I am going to get out of my PowerPoint here so we can see everybody. And if you have any questions, um, we have some in the chat box, I believe. Yep. Uh, are you going to ask those? Yep, I can go ahead and go through those. So the first question that came up was um, asked by Darren. Uh, he wanted to know about some vegetable varieties in our area that you can use perpetually or you could let to go to seed each year. So do you have any, any ideas of varieties of vegetables for our area or things that could go to seed for the next year? Sounds like a Linda question. Uh, I, I, I can't think of any because I'm, I'm a proponent of rotation. And if you leave something, go to seed in the same area, you're just going to create all kinds of problems. Um, you can't save your seeds. I, save, um, I saved some heirloom uh, Black Beauty tomato seeds last year. And that was the first time I tried to do seed saving with a uh, with uh, tomatoes because it's a process and they all came up and they're still coming up like crazy. So success. Um, I also have, uh, volu sometimes volunteers will pop up in your garden. So something will have, um, have uh, reseeded itself or come through your compost perhaps if you put something in your compost with seed and it'll pop up somewhere. And you can always, when they're little and you recognize it as something you wanna save. Um, I had that happen with squash last year and I wasn't sure, like in our, our previous submission, what kind of squash it was, um, but I dug it up and transplanted it to an appropriate area. And um, yeah, and it kind of took over my yard anyway, but, um, but you can save seeds from a lot of your plants if you like, and then just put them like, like uh, Linda said, in a different location the next year. 
Um, other than that, there are some, if you're, if you're thinking about perennial type vegetables, um, as opposed to annuals, you know, most, most vegetables are annuals and once that frost hits, they die. Um, but there are some things that come back. Um, asparagus is one that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, Megan grows asparagus. Um, that's one that you can grow that, you know, keeps coming back. You have to remember that where you plant it, that's where it's going to be. Um, so, uh, and then there's the always perennial herbs that you can keep. I have one um, raised bed that's just dedicated to the perennials um, because, you know, other than mint, most of them are, are manageable. The oregano is kind of filled in, but I, I we had mint in a bed that I wasn't, <laughs> it was before I became a master gardener mint, and um, we had to actually end up removing all of the soil from that bed because the mint kept growing back. Um, so basically I find, I, ha I, I moved it to a different location where it's under control, but basically I just find a lot of uses for mint. Um, so I dry it and, and use it in um, soaps and other things like that. So I have, I have a purpose for it and I cook with it. Um, but if you, if you think about what you're planting, think about whether it's an annual or a perennial and um, you know, you can plant annuals in different locations every year. Uh, perennials are kind of that's where they are unless you unless you can manage to dig them up when they're small and relocate them so I don't know if that was what you were thinking about or um was that was that Darren did I say yes mm -hmm. yeah thank you very much I appreciate okay. your help are you a new gardener um well I've been doing it for a long time but uh new in knowledge <laughs> we'll say <laughs> got yeah. lots of um uh, experiences that uh, um, I don't know how to solve. So I'll, I'll probably be back here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so thank you. Every year there's new problems. That's right. And you yeah. learn best by doing, you know. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the disease one year and the next year everything's perfect. And one year, you know, something grows great and the next year it doesn't. And, I mean, there's all kinds of variables and most of them it's weather, you know, whether it's too hot or too cold or too much rain or too little rain or you know, you never know what's going to happen. Every every year is new and exciting. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. I, I need to run to a different appointment, but I appreciate everyone's sharing. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank you, you for joining us. All right. Our, our next question is um, from Steph. She moved uh, here recently and she has invasive uh, Japanese barberry and wanted to get rid of them and the bush is covered with thorns. So what's the most effective way to do that without getting pricked constantly? Um, so I'll just chime in a couple things, you know, gloves, gloves, gloves are really important. Use long sleeves while you're doing it. You know, even if it's hot, you know, keep long sleeves. Um, one other thing I have um, horses. So I have feed bags, like thick feed bags that I, you know, you could potentially wrap up the top part, you know, while you're, you know, trying to pull it up after you know once you've dug, dug the hole um so that's one option or if you have some something that's like a even a tarp you have a tarp you can you know i'm just trying to think of like how not to get pricked um you know maybe a tarp could could do the trick uh anyone else have any other good tips for how not to get pricked while pulling it out well i don't have anything for that but i can tell you this before i became a master gardener i had several of those bushes and i ripped them out um, and I put stacked them up on the top of this uh, brush pile. A year and a half later, I go out there and I look and those plants were still alive and they didn't have any soil on the roots. They were still wow. alive. And to this day, I have a, a new plant pop up here or a new plant pop up someplace totally different in the yard. So they are extremely invasive. Um, so be prepared, keep your eyes open. You're going to see them popping up. This is right. Stephanie's question, right? Steph, yep. Yep, okay. Uh, yeah, I agree. Long, gloves, thick, heavy gloves, loppers, where you, you know, don't have to get too close to the plant. Um, if you're, are you in the country or are you in the city? Um, so we're in Bear. Okay, so more yeah. of a, uh, a congested area. Uh, I was going to say, if you were in the country, you know, what I've done, 
uh, when I used to live in Maryland and we had barberries and they do get everywhere. So what we had done was we chopped them down, chopped them up and burned them. Uh, good idea. But in your case, uh, take a trash can when you cut them, you know, cut, take your loppers and cut them into smaller pieces, throw them in the trash can from there, uh, send them off to the never, never land. Um, and again, paint that uh, stump with brush killer. And that should, but you also ha will have seedlings to deal with every time you find a seedling, pull it. That's All right. my Thank recommendation. Um, our next question comes from Kyle. Uh, we have um, our hydrangea has been has been has had some nice blooms this year, but what would be some proper deadheading techniques in order to encourage more blooms throughout the season? I think it depends on what type of hydrangea. <laughs> Macrophyllus. Okay, the uh, largely the mop head types. Um, you can cut the uh, the blossoms off as soon as they start to dry out. Uh, trim them lightly because I find I have one that if I get a little too ambitious with it, I won't have blooms the next year. So you want to deadhead them if you want to neaten them up. Do it pretty much right after they're done blooming. They bloom on old wood, if I'm not mistaken. So you don't want to do a lot of heavy pruning on them. Right. Uh, the next question is, what are the best, no, sorry. Next question is, um, I have never been successful preventing powdery mildew. What's the secret? <sighs> no overhead watering, number one. Right. Uh, plenty of sun, that helps. Um, good air circulation, so don't have your plants uh, too densely planted. Um, remove, if you've got something that's really got it bad, get it out of there and don't compost it. Get it in the, put it in the trash. Uh, and, and there are some s sprays that different kinds of spray you can put on it. Um, but that's actually should be more of a preventative measure. I mean, once you've got it, you basically have it. That's that's it. If you want to spray it, uh, spray it early before you see it, because once you see it, it you know, your spray is not going to work. Um, fungicides work before you see the problem. And there are some plants like phlox and bee balm that are, you know, very notorious yeah. for getting it. Um, you can, I know with phlox, you can clip out a few of the stems at the very base to kind of open up the plant and let more air circulation through it, which will help. Um, or planting varieties that are not known to be susceptible to it. You may end up having to dig them out if you know nothing else seems to work. Those are perfect answers. Great job, ladies, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, the next question is: What are the what are the best plants to plant after harvesting green peas in the same garden bed? So, like a crop rotation question. After peas. Well, peas um, are nitrogen fixing, um, so they're going to put nitrogen back in your soil. So anything that um, have, likes nitrogen and preferably not beans or something again where you just had that that particular type of crop in there where you had legumes. Um, I, I would think just about anything that you could plant there. I, I don't know of any any reason why you couldn't plant anything. Tomatoes, peppers. Are these um, <laughs> are the peas dense? Are they harvesters? I missed that part. I don't know. Uh, Ra Rashimi? Are your plants finished? Uh, 
I don't know if they're they're not. Yeah, yeah. I actually uh, they are uh, like uh, I am harvesting them right now, but I am planning like I am asking the question: What should I put after I harvest them? It's giving me a, a good harvest. Okay. Um, well, you know, you you the time of year is something that you have to consider too. So, um, squash like I, would be good. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would normally say that it would be a good thing to follow with um, lettuces and things, but it's just too hot in the middle of the summer to try lettuces. You can you can always put lettuces there um, later when it starts, you know, at the end of the summer when it's going to cool off, because um, lettuces just won't won't germinate or grow if it's if it's really hot like it's been now. Um, you could you could also you could probably try some herbs, yeah. um, maybe some parsley or cilantro. Um, or really, like like anybody said, almost anything as long as it wasn't something that needed such a long growing season that it's too late to plant. So you have to look at how many days to harvest um, whatever you're going to plant there. Would you? Yeah, agree? I already have the like plants ready to plant, and that side like squash and Indian squash and uh, pumpkin. Yeah, those and should be ash guard. Mm -hmm. Those should be fine to plant there. Can I plant cucumber uh, after that? Because I have the cucumber plant also. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. Thank, that helps a lot. Problem. Um, so the next question comes from Kyle again. What would be the best me best mechanical or cultural control for a camellia, uh, which appear to have signs of flower blight? Has already flowered for the year drop flowers and the new growth appears yellow or orange on the foliage as well as the back side of the flower petals. Would a specific fungicide be recommended in addition to mechanical controls? Mm. No. I'm not a camellia grower. I, me either. I would say, you know, at the when you when you see the leaves starting to drop, uh, you say they're yellowing and dropping rake them up and dispose of them in the trash. You don't want to leave them there. Um, are, you, are you sure it's camellia blight? Because I know with my camellias, it, the weather kind of affects how they look. Um, they do turn brown and yucky before they <laughs> drop off. Uh, there again, raking them up also. Um, you want to make sure that you've got anything that's dropping off the plant out from under it so that it doesn't cause more disease. Um, as far as the, if it is blight, honestly, I am not sure what chemical, but uh, there should be something that you could spray. I would say that it is fun fungal, most likely. Um, that we could research. We would need to research that. All right. Uh, the next question, uh, where can I get information on controlled burning to remove invasives? Um, so I would think your first step would be probably to call the Forest Service, uh, depending on your acreage. Sometimes they do some prescribed burns for natural areas. I don't know if maybe you butt up to a you know, wildlife area or what have you, but that, that's probably where I would start first. Um, and then you would probably have to contact, you know, once you get, you probably, I'm sure you have to have a, a permit. So, but I would start with the Forest Service, see what they have to say. And then, and then, you know, somewhere in the Delaware Department of Agriculture, they have like a burning section and then probably contacting your local fire department, like in those, that order is what I would assume. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any any insight on that? It sounds sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But but the Forest Service they do that often, you know, where they'll go yeah. out. In, mo but most of the time, those are for like national, you know, like state por you know, state forests and things like that. But they would at least know who to contact and and what permits would be required. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Um. Um. Vera said that Almanac.com has a successful rotation chart. Chart. I think it has seven categories, but but now Darren's gone. Um, thank you for answering my question. A new gardener, so lots of questions from Kyle. Um, similar to my first question, I have four China roses and have and have had blooms. 
I see lots of new growth as well. Should I lightly deadhead similar to the hydrangea macrophylla or sh or more severe where blooms have occurred to encourage new blooms? Thanks so much for the great knowledge. This has been an awesome experience. I would say deadheading is always a good idea for roses. I think that it'll help, you know, promote more, more uh, blooms. And they're, you know, just below where, where the uh, blossom is, you know, it'll form that uh, bulb kind of looking thing. Uh, cut it down, take it down to the first set of leaves and cut it just above the first set of leaves. All right, thank you. Um, Art McQueen said welder's gloves for pulling plants with thorns. That's a good point, welder's <laughs> gloves. That's a good idea. Uh, the last question here is my irises did not bloom for three or four years. What can I, what can I go to, or what can I do to coax them into blooming next year since this season has passed? I have similar experience. I got some bulbs for, or were some tubers from irises from a friend and it took them three years to bloom. I still even on, it's like they're blooming uh, down the line, like one year, a couple, and then more and more. Um, and so this, this is my fourth year and almost all of them bloom this year, but I don't know if that's normal or not, but from my experience that that is common for them to wait a couple of years to bloom. Also, if they've been there for a while and you say it's been three or four years, division, you need to pull them up, divide them and replant them. And when you do replant them, make sure that the rhizome is on top of the soil as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, you don't wanna plant them too deeply or they won't bloom. And if they are too crowded, uh, I have a few uh, iris beds here that, you know, they've been here for probably five years or more and uh, they need dividing because they will stop blooming if they get too crowded. I also wanna to, want to say that mine had poor soil um, and I added compost last year um, to them and it, that did seem to help. To that yeah, I, uh -huh. I, they used to bloom before and then they stopped. So I dug them out yesterday and put compost around it and redid of soil work, et cetera, to make sure that they had the needed nutrients if possible and added some more new soil to it, et cetera. And then I would think theoretically they so should So that's what I have year. done. Oh, they should this is because they were blooming before. They did so beautifully. I didn't have the heart to throw them out because I had very nice colors, yellow right. and all kinds of, you know, bearded iris, etc. So hopefully, maybe. So I'm not sure if I did the right thing. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you did. I think okay. that that should definitely help them. And this Thank is you. Verna. I had trouble with my irises and I had planted them in the fall and made sure the rhizomes were on top of the soil. But then over the winter, they got flooded. And mm. I didn't notice that. And then they didn't, when they weren't blooming, I looked and I noticed that the rhizomes were now below the soil. So just make sure in the spring that even if you planted them correctly, um, that they didn't get buried during the winter time. Right, and they like good drainage. They don't want to be sitting yeah. in water by any means. So does the rhizome have to be? Yeah, the rhizome should be on, almost top on the top of the, of the soil seat. and the roots buried, but that thick uh, yellowish rhizome should be as much as possible on top. And I wouldn't mulch okay, them. Okay, I will, I will redo them then. They, okay. they are on the surface, but I did cover a little bit with the soil. Yeah, as much as possible, keep the rhizomes up above the soil. Okay, we'll... Megan, you're muted. Ah, sorry. Uh, so uh, uh, Anu also has another question about her roses. Um, every year her roses come out nicely, but at this time their leaves the leaves have a network of holes. What can she do to prevent this? 
Sounds to me like uh, Japanese beetles. Is it too early for Japanese beetles, anybody? No, I um, haven't seen them yet, but. <laughs> it's a possibility. I didn't see. You've got Japanese beetles. I didn't see anything on them because last year as well, the roses come out, the leaves, the bush looks so beautiful, mm -hmm. but it's all the leaves are like, you know, like a lax network, you know, it's like, and, and they look a little brown. So it's possible they are, uh, you know, Japanese beetle. So I'll recheck them. Okay. I used to have luck with just spraying roses with a little bit of Dawn uh, soap liquid, tiny bit of that in a spray bottle with water and then spray soap. the leaves. What, what kind of soap liquid? Yeah, well, Dawn. I don't know if it has to be Dawn, but that's what I was told. Okay. okay. <laughs> Worth a shot. It won't hurt them. Was there any more questions, Megan, or? Oh, you said she had to, to step away. away. Yeah. I think that was the last question. Okay. Yeah. Um, like well, before we wrap this up, the, um, I wanted to let you know that the person who um, had all of those multiple questions uh, wasn't, she's really sad. She sent an email that she, uh, something came up and she couldn't make it. So um, maybe we can uh, put something together to have a conversation with her or get her to call the helpline or something um, so we can dig deeper into all of her um, issues that she's having. Uh, I, I told her we were still uh, still on and she could still log on, but she hasn't. So I guess she will she be able to access the recording as well. Right. She should be able to once it's there. It's just Sometimes it takes a while. We wait and wait for those recordings to show up and not not anything that our master gardeners can do about it. We're unfortunately at the mercy of other people at some times to get these things um, accomplished. So um, can we discuss the uh, hi, this is Lucretia. Can we discuss a little bit more of the the seed starting? Certainly. Certainly, um, Linda's our seed starting expert, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, no. so I did, when I started them in my basement, I did start them too early. I started them early uh, February and they kind of sat idle um, and I just, plus I didn't have any heater. I didn't have a heat mat and I thought, I think maybe it was too cold. Um, so then I, so then, um, I started some in my greenhouse because, uh, I have a rabbit that's eating them when I started them in the ground. So they were eating the leaves before they could even grow. And so I thought, well, I'll put them, I'll start the seeds in the greenhouse, but with this heat around here, the greenhouse was getting really hot. And so my husband was thinking that it was just too hot in there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, one of the things um, when you're using a heat mat, and, and I found this out the hard way, is you really need to have a thermostat on the heat mat. Um, because if you just plug it in, the, the temperature can range all the way up into the high 80s. And some, some of your plants don't want it that hot. And, and Debbie, I know you had it once before, and, and, and I don't know what it's called. It, it's a three-page uh, handout that we got that has a whole list of all these different plants, particularly vegetables, but I think it also had some flowers on there. And it talks about uh, how many days to germination, ideal soil temp, ideal uh, air temperature. Um, uh -huh. that, do you know what I'm talking about? I don't remember that. Was that was that one of the past workshops? Yeah, and, and, and I've got one somewhere I can dig it up, but it, it's something that that we've had we've had for a number of years. But I think this would be very helpful in this situation because if you if you've got if you if you're putting your lettuce, I'm just going to use this as an example, your lettuce seed seedlings on a heat mat and you're also putting your tomato seedlings on a heat mat, 
chances are the lettuce is not going to grow. It doesn't want to be hot. It likes to be cool or mm -hmm. vice versa. If you've got the temperature set for a cooler temperature plant and you're trying to germinate uh, eggplant and, and, and okra or something, it's not going to work. So you, you need to be careful of what you're trying to germinate, what you've got on what temperature on a heat mat. And also you got to look at whether they, they, they need um, strong sunlight or strong grow light. If you have a very weak grow light, then you, you're going to get kind of scraggly looking uh, flopsy mopsy type uh, seedlings coming up and they'll, they'll never thrive. Yeah, that's the problem. Because my grow light is is very weak, but I don't have enough sunlight, so you get it's, you know. And they also another recommendation I can make is that if you're starting a variety of seeds that come, that require different conditions, like what Linda was saying, like lettuce needs cooler soil, and you know don't put, don't put multiple types of plants in your same uh, tray. Keep mm -hmm. it all the same thing, so that if you have to move it to a different. Uh, situation to get more light or less heat or those kind of things that you can move all the plants that are the same um, and meet the conditions. Um, and I have a I have a grow mat. It does not have a thermostat, but if I think it's getting too hot, I either um, I can put something in between like a towel or something or lift it up, raise the thing a little bit off the heating mat or turn it off for a while. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of ways to navigate that, but I wish I had one with the thermostat, but that sounds like that might be expensive. <laughs> and what about the moisture? The, the moisture, um, I have them in, in a uh, cell that has the watering mat that goes you know, with it. Mm -hmm. So they're always, they're always moist and I don't know and they're just not taking. I don't know if it's too moist or, be, yeah. and then it gets too dried out. And so it's like, I don't know what to get, how to get them germinated. Of course the seeds could be bad, but I bought them, they're new seeds from Johnny Seeds. So I, I don't, I wouldn't imagine, I wouldn't imagine it was that. And are you using seed starting um, uh, mix or are you using potting soil? What are you using as a I'm, medium? I'm using seed starting mix. Okay. I found after I, I, I get the seed starting mix moist, not wet, but moist. And then I put it in the little, little cells and I plant my seeds and, you know, put a little sprinkle of it over the top. And then I get a, a spray bottle with water and I just lightly spray it with with the spray bottle and then go ahead and put it on the, the heat mat or whatever it is you're going to put it on under your grow light if it needs a grow light. And by the way, there are some uh, vegetables and fl uh, pl uh, flowers that don't want to grow light. They want to be in the dark. So that's, that's something else to keep in mind. But um, I don't, I stopped using the one that waters from the bottom because it kept kept the, the, the soil entirely too moist for seedlings and they started getting rot. Uh, they just fall mm -hmm. over and die on me. So I found it better to use that uh, spray bottle and just and you, spray and it or use an eyedropper and just drop as much water as needed just to keep it moist, not wet. And Okay, so it's constantly moist. Yeah, see, yeah, yeah that's not good. No, I mean, no, no. Okay, so good. constantly moist. Is that what you're saying? Not to spray. So when you spray bottle, when you use a spray bottle, do you spray it every day? No. Um, what I'm looking for is to see that it's it's. Um, actually, I use a toothpick. I just take a toothpick and stick it down the soil, and if if it's uh, if it's coming up dry and there's nothing on it, then chances are the soil's very very dry down below. But if it's got a little bit of uh, residue on it from the pot, uh, from the seed starting mix, I know it's still moist enough. It doesn't need to be watered because it'll dry off. Uh, the top layer mm -hmm. will dry out, whereas the bottom may still be moist. Right. And right. If, unless you have a way of checking down in there, you're overwatering. Okay. Okay. Great. That helps. Thank you. And I've had good luck, but I actually had the best luck by buying those little um, pods. 
um, I bought the organic ones and then you, you soak them in water and they expand and they look like little um, cylinder things. And then mm -hmm. they have a little hole in the top and I just put the seed in there. Um, I've had the better luck with those than I have um, with either peat pots or, um, or soil. The only thing is once the roots start poking out, you need to, to transplant them into something larger. Um, so that's what's worked for me. Although I, like I said, I don't have the best situation in my house of light to, um, to start seeds. I wish I had a greenhouse. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah, the one thing I wanted to mention about grow lights, um, which I think is relevant. I used to keep uh, planted aquariums and I know that they say that your light will start to lose its effectiveness after about six months of use. So if you've got a grow light that you've been using for like several years, it may be time to replace the bulbs. So oh, good point. Good point. Grow light is probably 10 years old. I need a whole new grow light, a whole new set <laughs> just a bulb. And our spring session is now officially over and uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna be charging ahead with summer. We got some cool stuff in the works. So um, keep an eye out for, for those. And we hope to see you uh, on our computer screens in the future. All right, thank you all. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.